Dentre os cientistas estrangeiros que costumam vir a Mamiroá fazer as suas pesquisas de campo, o professor Bill Hamilton é certamente um dos mais importantes. Ele é considerado por quase todos os cientistas biólogos como o mais importante pesquisador da evolução, a teoria da evolução de Charles Darwin. O que que traz o senhor com tanta frequência a Mamiroá? Um, uh, primeiro lugar, é um uh, lugar maravilhoso para mim. Uh muito diferente da Inglaterra e com diversidade enorme em comparação de lugares uh, assim em Inglaterra. Uh, este é um lugar único no mundo com o tamanho da enchente que vem aqui. Uh, 12 metros de água subindo cada ano e voltando. E, uh, sobre este tem esta floresta tão diverso e uh, uh, cheio de coisas de interesse. Uh, this uh, ant nest is a good example of a species that seems to be unique to the Vazia here. It's uh, I'm familiar with this kind of hanging nest in most parts of Brazil, but this one with the hanging uh, leaf-like structures uh, seems to be only found uh, here. I think it's a very good example of a uh, species which is uh, characteristic of the Vazia, very like the dolphin or the manatee in, in the water. And uh, uh, it's certainly very important for, for the ecology here, this ant will Uh, dominate the surrounding trees, determining everything that feeds on the leaves. Um, it's the sort of thing which uh, is, makes it very exciting for me to be here. This nest of Azteca ants is particularly interesting to me because it has a nest of uh, wasps living inside it. And uh, this is a, quite an unusual example of cooperation between two normally hostile species. And I believe it's a defensive combination. Uh, animals that might attack the ant's nest are frightened of the wasp. Animals that might attack the wasp nest are frightened of the ants. Certainly. I'm frightened of both. I wouldn't mess with this nest very much. I wouldn't even be standing here if it was a strong nest of wasps. You see there's a wasp there just about to go in. Fortunately, the nest seems to be very weak and uh, therefore is unlikely to attack me. If it was strong, I should not be here. And I believe the ants may treat the wasps as defenders for most of the time. But uh, when they're in real food shortage, as they may be here now because of the flood, they may turn on the wasps and, uh, uh, and devour them. Uh, this part of the Amazon Valley seems to be one of the centers for floating plants in the world, perhaps the greatest center of all. There are some 40 or so f free floating plants here, more than you would find anywhere else. And among them there are plants that when spread to the rest of the tropics have become really major pests. Um, here you can see that a lot of the plants, if you look at them carefully, are damaged by insects, uh, brown with fungi, um, and there are many natural enemies. But once they escape to another continent, normally those enemies are left behind, and the plants grow so fast without check that they cover dams, waterways, kill fish by covering the surface of the water completely, and so on. Um, and The solution to this problem, in several cases, has been to come to Brazil to look for the natural enemies here in these floating gardens and then carry them to the country concerned. For example, Australia had a major problem with this small water fern that I 
holding up here, uh, which literally covered the waterways of the country. They came to Brazil, found a small beetle, took it to Australia, and then the beetle multiplied so rapidly that within about six years the problem was finished. This water hyacinth, the one with the glossy green leaves and the floating the bulbs to make it float, that also became a problem in uh, the rest of the tropics. Uh, it's a very beautiful plant. I think it was actually taken to Cairo for decoration and from there spread up the Nile and very shortly was a major problem in, in Africa. There's been whole symposia devoted to the control of many of these floating Brazilian plants. But here they're no problem. As you can see, they, we can move between them quite easily. They're beautiful to see. Uh, for me, this is like the uh, center of civilization of floating plants. Uh, and it's uh, a pleasure to see them in their natural state, all mixed together, forming a little uh, floating uh, ecosystem. I find that here there are good illustrations of several of the evolutionary problems that are occupying me at the moment. For example, the problem of why sex exists, I hope to test with the plants of this environment. Uh, I see the plants here as being stressed by two different kinds of agencies. One is the enormous floods that uh, bury them to the depth of uh, 10 or 12 meters every year and presumably produce a tremendous physical stress on the plant. The other is the tremendous abundance of insect and uh, uh, life of small animals uh, that uh, attack them. And if my ideas about sex are right, the most uh, sexual plants will be those that have most attack from the biotic forces, whereas the plants that have just simply have to withstand the uh, physical forces of the flooding, uh, these will tend to be less sexual and I'm trying to see whether this idea uh, holds up. Uh, I'm also very interested in some other evolutionary problems that I think may be illustrated here. For example, for plants there is a big question of whether the main stem of plant evolution is through woody tree-like forms or through smaller kinds of plants. Do trees evolve into small plants more than small plants evolve into trees. I think an unsolved uh, problem of botanical evolution. And I see certain trees here, for example, these uh, cecropias, to me could well be herbs that have rapidly evolved in, into trees. They seem to be somewhat clumsy as trees. Their branch pattern is uh, very simple. On the other hand, there are many other trees here, for example, the laurels, which look as though they've been trees forever. They're very uh, finely branched, extremely strong woods, as much appreciated by, by the local people. And so I'm trying to see what sort of situations um, lead to trees evolving into herbs and what situations lead to herbs evolving into trees. Thank you, Bob. Oh, not the not the maid. <laughs> This is an aeroid uh, 
uh, family, Eric Casey, and uh, this is the first time I've seen it in flower, and I wasn't aware that it was so attractive to stingless bees, a little cloud of black bees that was buzzing around up there. Members of this family are very poisonous, and possibly because they're so poisonous, they don't have to worry about uh, insects devouring them. I think the small leaves often reflect the fact that the tree has to be prepared to lose a whole leaf because an insect will eat it, whereas uh, these, there are not many things that are, will dare to eat it. Normally the sap of this family is extremely caustic. If I were to touch this juice on my tongue, I might have a sore tongue for uh, days afterwards. Usually very, very um, uh, caustic uh, burning substances in the, in the sap. Uh, that's a, a guess, but that might be why they can manage to have large leaves when most things can't. Those beautiful leaves, these, of course, these are um, beloved all over the world and uh, often move from an environment like this into offices in uh, posh blocks in New York and London and uh, cultivated in circumstances that you would hardly guess had any relation to the place where they naturally grow, which is right here. To me, it's always a great thrill to see these plants that I know from London offices and uh, greenhouses in Britain growing in their, in their natural environment. Really wonderful plants. Very wonderful indeed.